uh, one of the reasons I chose this particular talk was the, the past couple of years we've been hearing a lot about conspiracy theories. And usually the term conspiracy has kind of a dark or ominous uh, tone to it. But the word conspiracy means simply conspire. A con means together, inspire means both breath and it also means spirit. So it means to breathe together and to come together in spirit. Uh, that's the, the original or the uh, basic meaning of the word conspiracy. So the divine conspiracy is, is one that I do believe in. It's probably the only conspiracy theory that I subscribe to is the divine conspiracy, which says the universe is conspiring to wake you up to your true nature. The universe in your life is conspiring to wake you up and show you who you really are. And so uh, a, a great story from the Hasidic tradition that I want to read right from uh, one of my books is the story of Isaac the rabbi. The story of Isaac is uh, one that is uh, kind of a legend or a myth or a folk tale. And like so many myths, uh, one person has said, it's something that's never been true, and yet it's always true. So it's timeless in its truth, yet it's not necessarily factual in its historical accuracy. So we'll talk about the story of Isaac. And I want to mention before I begin that Jeff and I have gone to uh, uh, all the great lengths and uh, <laughs> expended large sums of time and money to develop this uh, production that is second only to that of Broadway and, and maybe even then not so. So I, I want to give credit to, to, to Jeff and the work that he's done. And uh, we'll begin our story of Isaac the Rebbe. tradition comes the story of Rabbi Isaac, the son of Rabbi Yaakov in Krakow. Isaac was a very pious man and a very poor man. He was so poor that he lived in a one-room dirt floor house. One night he dreamed that he was in the great city of Prague, many, many miles away. In that dream, he walked through the streets of the city, admiring the beautiful buildings. Eventually, he came to the edge of the city where he saw a bridge, and beyond the bridge, a great palace. He walked in his dream across the bridge and began to dig. He dug and dug, and whereupon he eventually discovered a buried chest. He opened the chest, it was filled with gold, diamonds, treasures of every sort. Now this dream was repeated three times. So Isaac was convinced that it was a sign from the Lord. So he grabbed his shovel and he began the long journey to Prague. After many days of walking, he was very, very tired and his feet were very sore. Finally, after many, many miles of trudging and blisters and bloody feet, he reached the city. Although he had never been to this city before, in person, he recognized many of the buildings from the dream. They were exactly as he had seen in his dream. And sure enough, 
He walked through the city, he discovered the bridge. And beyond the bridge, the palace. He crossed the bridge and began to dig. Soon his shovel struck something. It was, it, he, he, he dug down and it was a buried chest. With trembling hands and pounding heart, he opened this chest. He looked inside, he, he opened the lid, he looked inside. And it was empty. It was empty. And brokenhearted as never before in his life, Isaac began to weep and then to sob uncontrollably. And he sobbed and he sobbed, but suddenly he felt a hand, kind of a big rough hand on his shoulder. And it was a young man wearing the suit of a palace guard. Hey, old man, what happened here? Why are you crying? Isaac recounted his story to the palace guard and upon hearing the tale, the young man laughed with great scorn. <laughs> You're a foolish old man to put such faith in dreams. Dreams are utter nonsense. I myself have had many foolish dreams. I pay no heed to any of them. Why, well, just to, for an example, last night, I had a dream about a poor rabbi who was digging a hole in the middle of his dirt floor where he lived. And in the middle of the place where he lived, he discovered this buried chest that was full of treasures. <laughs> Isn't that the most stupid dream you've ever heard of? I told you you're a fool for believing in them. Well, <laughs> Isaac was immediately on his feet. And with renewed energy, he began the long journey back home. He finally got back home, he flew open the door, he pushed the bed aside, he began to dig. And there, just a foot and a half beneath his bed, he discovered the priceless treasure where he had been living in poverty his entire life. to Fiddler on the Roof. <laughs> yeah. And uh, thank you again, Jeff, for that beautiful production. Uh, this story has a deep teaching. It's more than just an entertainment, but it's a story of each one of us. We're all Isaac. We're all Isaac in the sense that we have been given a dream by our culture, a dream that our happiness lies somewhere in the world. And this dream begins at a very young age and we begin planning our journey to Prague or New York City or Kansas City or wherever it may be to find happiness. So I just invite you to think for a moment back to when you were 10, 15, 20 years old, which I'm sure is not all that far back for most of you. And uh, what were you told? What, what did you come to believe would make you happy? Well, if you're like most of us, happiness was in the right career, the right mate, the right family, having plenty of money or nice house or 
many degrees or accomplishments in the world. We all were led to believe, or virtually all of us were led to believe that somewhere out there, if we work hard enough, if we travel far enough, we'll find something that will make us happy. And of course, it doesn't, it doesn't. And yet, one of the great paradoxes is that for us in unity, in our one of our basic books, Lessons in Truth, Dr. Emily Cady says, desire in the heart, desire in the heart is God tapping at the door of your consciousness, letting you know of all of the good that he has, she has for you. So how can it be that desire is God tapping at our heart and yet at the same time desire leads us into such great disillusion and unhappiness? Well, I believe the answer lies in the words desire in the heart. Yeah. God plants the desires in our hearts. What happens with us human beings is that the mind takes over. And the mind says that desire is not within me, but out there somewhere. The answer to my desire, that which will make me happy, is outside of myself. So for that reason, disillusionment, even though it's very painful, is, is really quite necessary. Disillusionment is not bad news. It feels like bad news. It's not pleasant at all. And yet it can be the thing that turns us back to where the true treasure is. Because if we even look at the word disillusion, disillusion, so it means to destroy, to kill, to take away, an illusion, because most of us live under illusionment. So to be disillusioned means that illusion is taken away. So what's left when an illusion is gone? I think. Ultimately reality, right? We're no longer looking through illusions, the eye of illusions, we're looking through the eyes of reality. Doesn't feel that way at first. See, first there's illusion, and there's disillusionment, and then there's reality. So with illusions, we have the facade of happiness, but that grows very, very thin. With disillusionment, we have the experience of considerable amount of pain. But if we're able to stay with that and see through it, what we discover is real happiness the true happiness that doesn't come from the world, that doesn't come from anything that changes or that can uh, die or go away, but rather it's the illusionment, the disillusionment that leads to the reality of who and what we really are. So there's a story in the Bible that kind of parallels this story of Isaac the rabbi. And if you uh, are familiar with it, maybe you're thinking of it already. Uh, does anyone have any suggestions as to any Bible stories that might parallel this particular story of Isaac? I'll give you a hint. It's in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 15. I'll read it to you. It, it will become familiar to you. The younger son gathered all that he had and traveled into a distant country. And there he squandered his inheritance in riotous living. When he had spent everything that he had, a severe famine took place in that country. And he began to be a need in great game. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of the country 
was sent into his field to feed the pigs. Now again, remember that to a Jew, feeding the pigs would, would be, uh, pig was considered an unclean animal. So it, it's, you're, you're at the bottom of the heap when you're feeding the pigs. And yet he would gladly have filled himself with the pods that the pigs were eating. No one gave him anything. So he had hit rock bottom. But then when he came to himself, when he came to himself, he said, wait a minute, how many of my father's servants have food enough and food to spare? And here I am dying of hunger. I will get up and go to my father. I will get up and go to my father. And what happened next? The father was there with open arms. He didn't even have to go to the father. The father came to meet him. There's a saying in many traditions that if we take one step toward God, God will take 10,000 steps toward us. So the turning point in the story is a very important one. In the, in the Gospel of Luke, it says, when he came to himself. And in the story of Isaac, the turning point came with the palace guard, right? When the palace guard told him of his so-called stupid dream. And the palace guard was the turning point and the person that sent him back to find the treasure within himself. If the palace guard didn't do it out of compassion or ostensibly out of love, he was just being who he was. And yet this person, this nasty young kid, was the one that woke him up, woke Isaac up. So, who, um, who's the palace guard in your life? <laughs> who is it that's shaking you and saying, hey, you stupid old man, you stupid old woman, wake up. And then all of a sudden it's like, wow, that's just what I needed. Oftentimes we don't see that when it's happening. When it's happening, we may feel great pain. We may feel great anger. But afterwards, we look back and we can say, oh, thank you. That was the best thing that ever happened to me. You know, that addiction, that, that so-called bad marriage, that John from hell, whatever it was that woke us up, that's the palace guard. You take many, many forms. Ultimately, that palace guard is inside of the ourselves. Sometimes the palace guard is what I call a, a, a hard turn, like the palace guard in uh, the story of Isaac, where he was just really rough and pushed him into the journey back home. And sometimes the palace guard is a little softer. You know, we don't have to have a tragedy in our life necessarily. But there comes a time when we begin to feel a disillusion. Maybe it's slow. Maybe it's just very subtle. You know, what's often called the divine discontent. It's like, okay, I'm really not happy. Let's look at why I'm really not happy. I've got everything I need, or maybe I don't, but I recognize getting more of what I want isn't going to answer the question for me. There's something more that I need something more that's important to me. So it turns out that you are that which you are looking for. You are that which is looking for. What you seek is that which is seeking. What you seek is that which you seek. You're looking for yourself. Now, not the ego self, of course, not the self that has the personal history, the, the, the biographical self, but your true self, the Christ self, 
the divine self. When we find this, our search is over. But we don't even have to find it until we discover that if we begin the search in earnest, even the search itself will bring to us all that we need. So I'll close with this quote from Matthew 6, 33. When Jesus said, seek ye first, seek ye first the kingdom of heaven, which is within you, and all else is added unto you. Seek ye first the kingdom of heaven, which is within you, and all else will be added unto you. So we discover that the treasure is within us, and that as we focus on that divine treasure within us, we'll have what we need in our life experience. And when we discover that treasure within us, we discover the reality of the words that God does not have the answer to our prayers. God does not have the answer to our prayers. God is the answer to your prayers. So the experience of God is really what we're all looking for. That's the one experience that will never die, that will never go away, that can never disappear. So with that, let's just take a moment to consider that powerful truth. And then we can segue into our uh, meditation time together. So just think about what you want. You don't have to give up what you want. You can want whatever you want, but just realize that's not what you really want. What we really want is a deeper experience of who we really are, which is the experience of the divine. So I invite you just to become still for a few moments. to breathe, if you can, to feel your heart center. And let yourself feel the heart of desire within you. And whatever you want, let yourself feel the desire for that. And know that when you get what you want, the desire is not gone forever. There's another desire that takes its place. And another, and another. So we let go of the desires of the mind for now. And settle deeply into the desire of the heart. The desire for God. The desire to be who and what you really are. So I invite you to breathe into your heart center. To feel that desire, the desire to be one with the one, which is the reality, the ground of your being. It is that in which you live and love and move and have your very being. So now we'll rest in the silence as we breathe in the silence of the heart. We rest in the silence.
And as we begin to bring our attention back to the world of the sights and sounds, we stay connected in consciousness to that place in our heart that knows who and what we really are. We live in the world, but we need not be of the world. We can be free in the world, free to be the divine beings that we are, that you are. I encourage you to step into this right now. And so it is. Amen. And amen. Thank you all very much. Robert, thank you very much. You are most welcome, all of you. Each of you. It was great. Uh, so much symbolism, and yet so. Uh, so much truth in the symbolism as well. So it's it's timeless, timeless truth. Yes, I say yeah. timeless truth. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for that. You're most welcome. Thank you for the opportunity. Yes, um, we have a little bit of time, and would you be open to uh, having some people ask some questions or? Absolutely. Yes, indeed, I would. Okay. Uh, so let me just open it up. To all of you, uh, if you have any questions for Robert uh, regarding uh, what we've just talked about or even something else, um, who's got something? Anybody? So I have a question. Barb. So, Robert, with the prodigal son, when he leaves and then comes back to his father, is, um, is that his separation from? when he leaves his separation from his divine consciousness? Yes. And once again, that's like um, Isaac, when he has his dream and goes to Prague, you know, searching for the answer to his dreams. And this is not, I want to emphasize, this is not a mistake. It's not something we do wrong. It's something we are all conditioned as human beings to, to do. I mean, from the moment we're born, you know, we're given that conditioning that says, you know, you're to be somebody and this is where your happiness lies. And uh, I think we can all relate to the messages we got. And, uh, and you know, the, the, for, for me, it was, you know, if, if, I, if I worked hard enough and if I knew enough, those were the two things. Huh. If I learned enough and worked hard enough, uh, I'd be happy forever after. And uh, so we all have those statements that if only then I'll be happy forever after. You know? And that, that's, that's very deep, very, very subtle. So that, does that help, Barbara? Yeah. Hey, Lynn, you uh, wrote something about uh, Sufi in the chat. What was that? Would, can you repeat that? Un unmute yourself. Okay, there you go. Okay. Um, when he first, well, I said the kingdom of God is within you because I thought that was one thing he was saying. And then I, the last thing I said was, Rumi says what you seek is seeking you. Yep, you got it. So yeah, the treasure within is seeking you. Only the mind gets a hold of that seeking and, and believes that it's got something to do outside of us. And uh, that's what exactly happens. So yeah, yeah, that what you seek is seeking you. And uh, th there's another quote from Romy, he, he says, uh, uh, oh, many a man has started out on a journey in search of the place where he began. Hmm. Oh, many a woman has started out on a journey in search of the place from which she began. Mm -hmm. So th that, that's, uh, that's another roomie. 
And then there's a, like a T.S. Eliot poem. I you got know. it. You want to you want to go ahead and say that line? Uh, uh, will we start somewhere and end up where we began? You, you got it. Yeah. The end of all of our searching is when we go back to the place we started and see it for the first time. Yeah. 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 So it, the place when we go back to where we started and we see it for the very first time. So. So Robert? that happens when we come back home. It's like we see with new eyes. I had I saw Doug Douglas had his hand up. Do uh, you have time for Doug for his question? Absolutely. Well, I I just wanted you to clarify the desire of the heart versus the ego uh, want, and you did that. Okay, got it. Good. Thank you, Robert. I had a. I had another quote from another sage. Uh, Wayne Dyer once said, I think it was his original quote. He said, you can never get enough of what you don't need. Right, exactly. That's, that's what we keep looking for, isn't it? What we, what we really don't need. You know, there, are, there are things in the world, of course, that we need. We need food, we need shelter, uh, just to physically stay alive. But that's not what keeps us happy. Right. Not what keeps us happy. Kim? I have a question. So knowing what we're seeking and seeking it is the journey. It isn't really getting there. It's just seeking it and continuing on that. Is that correct? Yes. Yes. The, because the reason... I say yes, that, that we never really get there because it's open-ended. Ah, it's ah. not like a football field that has a goal line. Ah. And yet we discover it in the journey itself. So that, that changes it, things. That changes things a lot. You, you bet. You bet. So that so the the, the the journey and the discovery really kind of get mixed up in a way because we discover that the whole Light, our whole life is a journey. So it's more a matter of how we're taking, uh, how we're living in the journey. So instead of being frustrated that we're not reaching that goal, we should just be really pleased that we're on that journey. Amen, a, a woman. Yes, indeed. So, yeah. so it's, it's like uh, the very fact that you're seeking something means that it must already exist within you. So just go to that place where it already exists. So we can do that right now. If you got just a minute, it only takes a minute. Go to the place that knows who you really are. Just take 10 seconds if you can. Don't try to get there, just go to the place that already knows. The place that knows that you know. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, what, what did anybody just sort of feel a slight shift? Yeah. yeah, Kim, you want to say anything, Kim or Neil? Well, I always, the fact is I've known since I was about four what my journey is, but I've, it's clear to me, it's clear what the journey is and it's clear where I'm happy. And I, I've always struggled with not obtaining that all the time on this earth, but you've really helped me clarify it. But yeah, it's really easy to, to go there. Good, good, thank you. It, it's sort of like there's 1% of us that knows already and 99% of us that doesn't know. And most of the time we're identified with the 99%. So if you can just go to that 1% that knows and invite the other 99% in, it, it, it's a whole different spin on, on the journey. It's read, rather than you trudging towards the goal, you are the goal inviting the rest of yourself in. 
So does that make any sense? You know, you are the treasure, you you are the father. You're not seeking it. So I've always said uh, about myself that I try too hard. We all do, yes. And I think that by <laughs> not trying so hard, things just appear. Yes. There's a great Zen story about a Zen master who was meditating and he could hear these footsteps and he looked up and here's a young man running this way as fast as he can. He's running this way as fast as he can. He runs this way as fast as he can. Finally, the Zen master says, oh, hey, young man, can you come over here a minute? He says, what, what, are, you, uh, what are you running for? And the young man says, he's out of breath. And he says, I'm, I'm trying to catch enlightenment. And, and the, the, the Zen master says, well, that's good. That's good. He says, but uh, what if you just stood still and realized that enlightenment may be trying to catch you? <laughs> OK. So let, let, let God find us. So we're running away from, we're pushing God away in our trying. Because when we try to do something, we assume we're not do, already doing it, right? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if we, if we know that we're already there, it's a very different place. And, and being already there doesn't mean we're done. It simply means that there's a part of us knows that we are what we're looking for. But there's a lot of part of us, our human self, that, that's still lost. So just invite that in. Just invite it to come back in and welcome all of that with your open arms. It, it's much easier than climbing a mountain or whatever metaphor we want to use. You know? So I'll give it back to you, uh, Jeff. Robert, thank you so much. That It was You're just welcome. a pleasure, just wonderful to hear all that. Good, good, good. Thank you. Stick around uh, if you'd like. Uh, we're going to uh, talk a little bit about our uh, community concerns and uh, hear from everybody about what their lives are like and some things that are pressing for them. And uh, it would be interesting to apply what we're just talking about to those concerns. Okay, if you don't mind, I'll just sit here and eavesdrop a little bit. And, uh, yeah, sure. Get 